I think that uh, abdominal wall reconstruction and hernia surgery, because we're dealing with a huge variety of actually of problems, uh, we need to expand our toolkit as much as we can. So I think that uh, I liked uh, Danny's slides very much about we try to we, we should try to close the or reconstruct the abdominal wall for the functional results, and we should try to use uh, foreign bodies such as mesh outside the abdominal cavity. But that does not exclude other solutions because sometimes you have a problem that you cannot solve with these principles. So I think there's room for every technique depending on the patient and the problem. Uh, open, minimally invasive, uh, ETEP, TAR, or, or one-sided TAR, uh, two-sided TAR. Uh, depending on what uh, kind of patient you're dealing with, how many up, uh, times he was operated before, what are the missing parts in his abdominal wall. So I think IPOM, uh, I prefer to do IPOM uh, plus because I, I think that mechanically it makes a lot of sense to bring the abdominal wall compartments back together again and then reinforce it with mesh. But I think it has room in patients where other alternatives don't make any sense. There's another alternative for treating small umbilical hernias or medium-sized umbilical hernias that was not mentioned here, which I, I, I do quite frequently, which is to do a tap for umbilical hernia. In many patients, you can raise just the, the peritoneum, the, uh, the abdominal wall, the anterior abdominal wall peritoneum, starting from the falciform ligament, create a, a flap that's big enough, repair, suture the hernia, put a mesh in, and close the peritoneum, only the peritoneum on top of that mesh, which I think is a very nice alternative for many patients. It's very easy to, uh, to reproduce. It does not require a lot of uh, dissection, and you get very, very good uh, results using the same principle of separating the, the mesh from the abdominal wall content and, and from the skin. But I think IPOM has room in patients where, you, where other options are, are not appropriate. So in principle, you would avoid putting a mesh on bowel or abdominal organs. If I can. If I can. If you can. Yeah. <coughs> Do all of all of us yeah. agree with this? I think the variety is not only of the patients or the millions, but also of the surgeons. And we have to adapt what we can do and know how to do to the conditions that we deal with. So I wouldn't ban any procedure that is basically good. So I think we have for maybe, maybe 20 years already. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are great and the overall results are quite good. And we have problems that we have to, to prevent. So we have to know how to prevent them. If we can keep the, the, the mesh outside the abdomen, of course it's better. But I cannot say that it's a completely dead procedure or should never be used. As we saw here before, it can be used as a salvage procedure and for some mid-sized hernias or a chain of small hernias, I think it's acceptable. Uh, we have the mesh, the protected meshes that we know that sometimes it doesn't work, but many times you go back to the abdomen and you see that there are no, not many adhesions and everything is okay. And the experience of, for that, it's quite uh, quite large. So I wouldn't say that uh, we have to just stop the, this procedure or it's dangerous or shouldn't be done. I agree with Amik that uh, we have to have a, a toolbox and we should ch uh, choose what we what is, is more appropriate for us at the moment for the same patient for in the, with a, a, a specific hernia. But it's certainly not dead. Maybe it's a slow death, but it's not dead yet. <laughs> I think uh, that IPOM is not uh, dead yet. Uh, it should uh, be preserved to should be preserved <laughs> a smaller size hernia. We should all keep records of uh, our of the width of the hernia. Uh, when we were looking uh, at our cases, uh, we, we collected 312 cases of. Uh, 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 abdominal wall hernia repairs that were done uh, laparoscopically and uh, openly. Uh, and we saw that uh, if we are dealing with a wide uh, hernia that is more than seven centimeters, we have much more re recurrence in uh, IPOM. And uh, I 
think that uh, if we use peritoneum, we will still have uh, recurrence. If we, we are trying to uh, repair uh, wider uh, size uh, hernias. So uh, we must, uh, in certain cases, uh, realign uh, and uh, do a, an abdominal wall uh, reconstruction. But not in the <coughs> I agree with previous colleagues that we sometimes overestimated the dangerous of intra-abdominal meshes, especially the small ones. So, uh, in, the, in the other uh, side, abdominal wall reconstruction, especially minimal invasive abdominal wall reconstruction, is very, very dangerous, very dangerous area. We don't know yet where we, where we are. This is uh, un unfamiliar for most of us, and uh, every step we should uh, uh, think if if we can proceed it or not. So I think for most of uh, general surgeon, eyeball must uh, still uh, uh, good operation. One, one uh, condition, you have to uh, reconstruct the mini -album. every time, even if small, even in small areas, even if area of one or two centimeters. <coughs> and uh, still perform, I hope this is in, in, in new era of robotic surgery, if you perform an uh, iPhone with a robot, it may be, it may be much more easy and much more uh, 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 comfortable for uh, for social work and uh, less dangerous for patients. That's what I say. I probably don't know all the advanced measures that are meant to be uh, positioned over power. But my experience from uh, reoperations, I don't know any mesh that doesn't adhere to bone. Any. For years we thought the physio mesh is such a mesh that is safe enough. And I can tell you that my personal opinion is that all meshes adhere to bone. And as a principle, I think we should avoid putting meshes on <coughs> bowel. This is one thing. Other thing about iPhone is that bridging iPhone, I think it's easy to prove that bridging iPhone is not good enough. For many reasons. I won't start counting them now. And iPod Plus, when you try to close the, the defect, that's good as long as you don't force the closure, apply pressure. Because the very most important paradigm that we act on for the last few decades is tension free. IPOM Plus is, is a good solution as long as you don't apply any tension on your closure. <coughs> if you apply tension, so expect the essence of this closure and then expect the recurrence of the, of the hernia. Because when the defect is open, so you don't know if you put the mesh in the right place and, and the, the margins are good enough, etc. And then again, you get a bridging iPhone, which is not good in my opinion. So I agree with what uh, Dr. Romana presented earlier and uh, somebody else said it before. I think it's an acceptable salvage procedure in cases of, of a real problem. But as a principle, we should try to avoid it. <coughs> this is my personal view. 
what do you think about iPhone uh, for use in fashion, the high risk of fashion, and morbid obesity? <coughs> Actually, we know that iPhone has le less uh, infection, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's probably better if we can correct the problem. If the patient is morbidly obese, uh, he, sh he should uh, lose weight. Uh, not all patients can uh, correct the immune system, but uh, it's something that we should keep in mind uh, when we are using iPhone, but uh, they will also have a much greater problem with the minor uh, Mr. Terotomy. So everything should be taken into account. If I may say something. Uh, it's fine to say that uh, IPOM would have uh, very low chances of infection, so it's a good choice in an obese patient or uh, a patient with some degree of immune uh, compromise. But what kind of hernia are we talking about? If it's a simple primary hernia, there's no argument, fine. But if we are talking about a complex recurrence, the patient has a previous mesh, the patient has a large defect, or multiple defects, then uh, IPOM is certainly not going to help because you are likely to uh, have a higher incidence of uh, seroma and ileus. So I would be worried about that seroma needing intervention and so uh, I would uh, want a more definitive and more aggressive procedure even though the patient is immune compromised. For example, <laughs> So, uh, depending again on what kind of situation we are talking about, it could be uh, a minimally invasive AWR or it could be an open AWR, uh, like a TAR. It could be an ETEP TAR in my hands or open TAR or a robotic uh, TAR. Again, if you're uh, a votary of the posterior approaches, it's a good idea to have a posterior approach uh, to uh, <coughs> reduce the chance of uh, mesh explantation. Uh, an onlay uh, is a safer option if the abdomen is uh, hostile, if the patient has had mystentrotomies, laparotomies, colostomy and all of that kind of thing and then you might be safer just doing an onlay and just uh, hope that uh, you can minimize the chance of a wound infection uh, by using a white uh, lightweight macroporous mesh but uh, everything would depend on what specific case we are talking about. And I, I would like to ask the panel um, your opinion about um, the diastasis recti and very often combination diastasis recti and the <coughs> in the small umbilical hernia and wide diastasis recti. And, uh, how would you approach this? Quite often. Uh, me? Uh, you and, uh, and you You start. Well. Uh, I think. Uh, a couple of things have to be uh, digested. One is general surgeons generally have avoided operating on diastasis. Number two, plastic surgeons have always operated on diastasis. Number three is without addressing a diastasis, just putting a patch of uh, plastic for a, an umbilical defect is not going to be a great uh, strategy because uh, that diastasis is still going to make it look like the patient has a hernia. The patient won't know much of a difference. And for all you know, the midline breaks down, those sutures or tacks, uh, they don't hold and the patient has a recurrence just beyond the edges of that mesh. So then you will have a more complex hernia because now you have a a mesh which needs to be explanted, tax which need to be removed and as we discussed it, it becomes a complex hernia by definition. So I would say that if possible fix the diastasis 
when you're doing the hernia. So obviously, uh, if the skin is very bad, excessive, uh, loose, dystrophic skin or a bad scar, then a tummy tuck would not be a bad idea at all because you're resecting uh, the excessive soft tissue and skin which is bad and make it look nice. And then at the same time you can uh, repair the defect and the diastasis and use a mesh. And some people may disagree with using a mesh there, but I, whenever there's a hernia, there's no argument in my book. There has to be a mesh uh, involved with or without diastasis. The other option is if the skin isn't that bad, if there is not too much of saggy, loose uh, fat, then you could very well do a subcutaneous on the uh, laparoscopic approach, the scola operation or the repa operation. So that gives you a minimal, uh, minimally invasive solution to both the diastasis as well as the hernia. And it's a very elegant operation uh, if you choose your case properly. I would probably go directly to the last sentence if you choose your case properly because first of all I think diastasis in elderly men is completely overestimated as a problem. I mean you, you really just need to speak to your patients and tell them that unless they feel something bad it's a cosmetic problem. I don't think it should be fixed. I don't think there's any evidence that you should fix it. So it usually boils down to either a a part of a abdominal wall repair or umbilical or incisional hernia repair, which I think then makes sense to repair it as treat it as a continuation of your hernia. But the biggest problem is the patients that are operated by plastic surgeons who are usually thin women with a very obvious diastasis that bothers them cosmetically. So first of all, their expectation level is completely different from your other patients. They don't care about the, the functional problem, they care about the, the way it looks. So you're going to a different ballgame. And the second thing is that the options here are quite limited. So what I did a few cases of subcutaneous repairs. <coughs> the, the problem with these patients is that it takes them a long time to heal and for everything to go back to where it was, and they, they drive you completely crazy. So you be prepared to be a plastic surgeon for that, for that matter because they have a completely different relationship with their patients. It's, it, dry, it can drive you nuts. Like, because they have seromas that you cannot avoid many times. And the skin in the beginning bulges until it flattens out because it's, you know, you're, you're approximating the, the, the skin a little, so it bulges in the front. And I mean, I try to avoid these patients because I, I, I'm on my phone all day with, with patients complaining about things that are, I, I have no experience in treating anymore. And I use, um, I use some fibrin glue to try to avoid the seromas, but some degree of deformation of the abdominal wall happens. The best patients for, the, for that matter is exactly the patients with a lot of excessive skin where you combine open procedure with, with a plastic surgeon who does a tummy tuck and then they call him. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Danny the same kind of question. There's a patient with a four centimeter umbilical hernia with a diastasis in a, a 50 year old woman or a 45 year old woman and uh, she's come to you with, uh, you know, she's seen uh, somebody else and that surgeon has said that I'm going to do an eye palm and at the same time, uh, he's not written it, but he said that, you know, that diastasis will close from inside. How do you respond to that approach? It's possible, of course, and it's being done, but I tend to tell, I think one of the problems with the question, not the question itself, but it demonstrates that we tend to put everything in one, one box, and it's certainly not like that. And one other problem that we see in uh, this uh, kind of abdominal wall reconstruction case, cases is that the tendency to do something which is overkill is much higher, because we have so many options, and why not do that? It's like, like UK, so we do also, also the gallbladder. Also. We don't have to combine anything. And if there's really four centimeter hernia, which I can easily close with a small open approach, preperitoneal mesh, close the defect above it, and I have good, good enough fascia around it, and uh, the mesh is wide enough underneath, then I would just leave the diastasis. Uh, I'm not sure we have to fix everything. And uh, if young patients, after a pregnancy of uh, triplets, with huge abdomen, everything is separated, that's another story. Uh, then. She may need her diastasis repair, but in most cases, diastasis is not a real, a real uh, issue. And uh, you, of course, you can co combine anything, fix the hernia, and do the diastasis. But the question is really, really, if 
Is it needed? In most cases, I think it's not needed. So far, I never tried the scholar technique. And I think that the aesthetic structure itself is a problem if it interferes with function of proper function of the abdominal wall. And it depends, obviously, on the patient. Usually, it will be related to women after um, uh, multiple pregnancies uh, or um, morbid obese patients. So if the lady doesn't plan any more uh, pregnancies uh, and if the morbid obese patient will agree to a bariatric procedure uh, before um, addressing the, the aesthetic strategy, then I think in case it is symptomatic, I mean interfering with proper abdominal uh, wall physiology, we should uh, repair it. And in the best cases that I did so far were open. So uh, with or without the plastic surgeon, it doesn't matter. But uh, I have not enough experience. I saw this color procedure in your Congress in uh, Delhi. It was nice. I really don't know. I have not, not enough. Uh, um, in the, in the uh, hypothetical situation, which is in reality not so hypothetical, at least in India, um, I have a, a problem on principle with diastasis, which is a defect or weakness of the anterior fascia being treated with a laparoscopic plication and an intraperitoneal mesh. So, I would say that uh, on principle you should be repairing the tissue which is weak and from inside you are going to be taking bites of peritoneum and posterior rectus sheath and bringing them together does not really work and because it does not really work you are putting in a large intraperitoneal uh, mesh which has its own problems. So, that is the uh, that is my uh, point. The one more thing uh, which has come from uh, experience is in many of these obese women who are concerned with a small umbilical hernia or a diastasis, I have seen that if you close the diastasis even in double layer, there was an original Colombian technique uh, with double layers, intraperitoneal you take the posterior sheath peritoneum and then pull the trocars out, put them on the subcutaneous plane, create subcutaneous space around the midline and suture uh, the edges of the uh, linear bar together. So, give it a nice midline ridge. So, posteriorly uh, you have fixed it, uh, anteriorly you have reefed it, you have uh, got a good uh, linear alba now. Now, the problem with that as in all the hernia surgeries we do is with time those tissues break down again and now those sutures start cutting through and creating genuine hernias now. Where the patient did not have a hernia, now the patient will have a hernia. But now you know so. what to do. <laughs>